this is Chuck. And this is Karen. And this is our show. What if it really works? Our practical guide to spirituality. And Karen, who are we talking to today? We're going to be talking today with Kaylin Sullivan Tootrees. She is an indigenous elder who has worked all over the world here in North America with the Lakota, the Kiowa, and the Choctaw tribes, and in Africa with the Bakonga and Yoruba, and in New Zealand with the Maoris. And this woman has traveled the world and has learned so much that she wants to share with us, and we are blessed to have her as part of our program today. Thank you for joining us. So here we go. It's going to be a great interview, and we're glad you're with us, and we hope you get as much out of it as we did filming it. So, Karen, find out who she is. <laughs> the work you do, it's quite magical, isn't it? Oh, that's a big question. Uh -huh. I think it changes day to day who you are. I think it's a continually um, evolving work in process. Mm -hmm. And uh, the thing that I say most about myself that I think has shaped anything that I do and how I am in the world is that I'm a child of the crossroads. And that I come to the crossroads being born at the junction of three cultures because I'm um, Native American, African, and European. And that um, I lived in all of those cultures and with those elders and ancestors from the time I was born and switched cultures. I'd been in three different languages by the time I was 10. Oh so there's something for me that's really important about the place where things bump up against each other and intersect and find resonance or dissonance with each other and pass through on their way to somewhere else. Um, so I've really kind of I don't know, built a little camp at the crossroads. <laughs> but my practices also are the, the work that I've done all my life and the teaching that I do is born at that crossroads. I've worked with elders from European mystery traditions and Congolese traditions and Yoruba traditions and Lakota traditions and Maori traditions in New Zealand and worked to find the energetic underpinnings that we all share in our spiritual work. And so working across all those boundaries and with all those different elders from all those different lineages has really, um, I don't know, forged me in a way because I still feel I am still beholden to all of those and their own struggles to survive. And I'm also trying to feel differently my together ability to way forward without having to usurp or appropriate or try to engage another culture as our own. So that was a great answer. <laughs> <laughs> well, that doesn't sound complex at all. <laughs> I'm really oniony, I think. I think, you know, I think that there's, a, I, I, I really see myself as an onion. You know, you pull away a layer and, oh, there's another layer under that. You pull away another layer and there's another layer under that. But, and of course we all are. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so when you're combining these or attempting to combine these different traditions, one of the questions that I've had on my mind for a long time is, are we headed to a point where there's going to be a common spiritual experience? Mm. Okay, uh, two things. One is, um, over about the course of about 30 years, I developed something called Seven Directions Practice. And what I did was try to take the essential teachings from each of the, from these traditions, the thing that seem the things that seemed to resonate and were similar, or that informed each other more mm -hmm. clearly, and I worked with the elders from all those cultures to do that. So when I said I was forged, I meant they told me what I could share and what I couldn't share, and what I could tell and what I couldn't tell, and what was appropriate to put together with something else and what wasn't. So I think that. Um, it's, for me, it's not so much about having a common, well, 
I'm, I just, I think I'm, I'm trying to grapple with the word common because I think we are having a common spiritual experience. <sighs> and I think that we experience that differently and we articulate that experience differently. So I, you know, the, I think there's a, all roads lead home. So all those paths, I think, lead to the mystery. And each path articulates itself a little bit differently. So I think it's both, it's like nature, like ecosystems. It's unique. It's diverse. It's interdependent. And it's self-organizing. So each one is all four of those things all of the time. And we're experiencing that that common thing in a unique way that's diverse <laughs> <laughs> that self-organizes around how we make meaning out of things mm -hmm. so each i think each individual even within a tradition has a different path does am i making sense may have great sense. Mm -hmm. great sense and, and and i guess the the next question that i that i would ask is uh we are going through some kind of a big change right now, are we not? My answer to you earlier was, you think? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've been going through a change, and I think that we're coming, we're coming to the, like the peak experience of change uh -huh. in, because we've been going through what, what I would call the quickening for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And what's happening is like any wave, it crests, and I think we're really hitting crest. And one of the things that I find myself thinking about and talking about a lot right now is disruption and dismemberment as part of the creation. That disruption, that, that this, this quickening has, is creating a tremendous amount of disruption. And that disruption is like seed coat breaking. It's opening up other layers of consciousness so that we can grow into something new mm -hmm. feels awful. <laughs> Disruption <laughs> feels awful. Um, dismemberment, even, you know, all the old myths, the creation, you know, we, we got food from the dismemberment of the gods. We got sky from the dismemberment of the gods. We got, you know, our world was created from a kind of pulling ourselves apart and putting ourselves back together again. So I, that feels like to me what's, what's where we're at. We're at that pulling apart place and that peak, that, that cresting place. Mm -hmm. Is it appropriate to ask, is there a time, that you, a time frame that you see this cresting moment occurring? I think we're in a part of the crest. I, you know... When I grew up, my grandmother, when you ever you asked her anything about, you know, how long grandma or whatever, or, or when did that happen, grandma, she always said, well, I was living and living and living. Oh. And that's when that was. Oh, so beautiful. the time for this is, I think we're living and living and living uh -huh. into the crest. Uh -huh. And we can do that awake, or we can do that on snooze. You know, and it, it also means being, bringing to our own practices and our own relationship with all of the rest of the living, which means the plant people and the stone people and the creepy crawlers and the standing people and all of them. With all of that life, we're living and living and living into the crest. So there's a lot of information that's actually available to us from the rest of life that we're not paying much attention to right now. So that immediately brings us to the question of the bees, which we discussed before we started this. That's one of the messages, right? Uh, that's an, it's, it's an, not just their loss. I mean, we can talk about the loss of the, the incredible loss of honeybee life and as a pollinator, as a message. But I actually mean the bees have a message. Not just, not just the fact that, they're, that we're losing them, but if we listened to them. You know, and some of the, the most um, amazing bee 
keepers around. There's, there's a woman in Asheville, North Carolina, Deborah Roberts, who's um, a bee mistress, and she listens to the hive. Oh. That's the teaching. She listens almost every day to the hive. And that's where the message is. So I think just, you know, the birds, the, the uh, all of it, uh, everything in the web of life here is telling, could be telling us how to do the crest better, <laughs> how to be in the crest more fully so that when we fall apart, we really do create something new, that we do provide food and the sprouting for the next incarnation of whatever this earth walk is meant to be, with us or without us. Now tell us a little bit about the, the, the work that you do with the, with the bees whenever you create your memorial and the artwork that you create from them. Yeah, one of the things that I was really struck by um, when I first was around beekeepers, and I've always been mesmerized by bees because bees are meant to be the ancestors. That's the voice of the ancestors. Um, and so, uh, and bees have always been really present when something important was happening in my life. So, um, when the hives started disappearing and collapsing, um, I took, visited some beekeeper friends of mine and there were just bee bodies all over the ground. And I thought, all of these bees died and we don't know why, and they make our food. <laughs> and no, the beekeepers are mourning, but there's no mourning for this. So I had, and I have now about I guess about 15 beekeepers around the country. So when a hive dies, if they can, they send me all the bodies of those bees. Oh, how wonderful. And so then I take the small, the bodies, and I put the bees individually into tiny little glass vials, and I create memorials for those bees that were lost. And I usually tell the story of what happened with the hive. So there's a little, there's always a narrative of what happened. Strange little exits by the queen, mysterious disappearance. I mean, the, the stories are heart-wrenching. And, and um, so I, because we're live and people can hear this, I just want to say that the memorial I'm working on now, which is, um, which I hope to make over time um, into something large scale is for 7,000 hives that were on a semi being tr trucked across the country and the semi overturned on I-35 in Minnesota this summer and they fire hosed those hives uh. because the bees were agitated. Uh. So I've been making small pieces called Bees Who Travel by Truck. Um, but oh. my hope is to eventually do a large piece mm. because that's something like 17 million bees. So for me and for the viewer who may not be fully up on this, what is happening to the bees? They are disappearing? I, I, there's a lot of scientific um, information and for that for the real deal about that, you should really talk to someone like Deborah. Yeah, <laughs> but, we will. Um, hopefully. But I think there are also, there's also a real resurgence of beekeeping. There are people doing incredible work to bring bees to consciousness. At Chicago, on the south side of Chicago, there's a business called Sweet Beginnings. And it's for ex-offenders getting out who can learn to be beekeepers. And they're raising bees and making beautiful products out of the honey that comes from those bees there. Tennessee minefields, they're trying to reclaim some of those, some of that land by planting bee-friendly flowers so that there can be beekeeping. So I think that there's, there's both a real challenge fr from unknown sources, from chemicals, from trucking bees across the country to pollinate because you've planted too much and the bees there can't mm -hmm. handle it, mm -hmm. to a real real re-engagement 
with the, the, the practice of beekeeping and natural beekeeping too, not so much feeding them sugar water over the winter and um, really caring for bees. You have a project that's in Santa Fe right now. In the there, the Santa, Santa Fe Book Arts Guild does a show every year at the Rotunda, and I have two pieces. One is a bee piece for six hives that um, that died in Weaverville, North Carolina, and uh, and the other is a piece that's kind of an homage to the moon, <laughs> but all the pages are dipped in beeswax. So. Um, so yeah, I have those two pieces in that show now. It'll be up till December. So if anybody uh, comes to Santa, if anybody comes to Santa, go to the Rotunda. <laughs> also, other beautiful books. Great, great show. So. So, you're among other things an artist. Mm -hmm. What else are you? Oh. Um, when I'm when I'm being kind of rowdy, I'd say that, um, I'd say I'm a, cart a tracker and cartographer of consciousness. Oh, that's big. That's what I think I do, really. Um, I think I track patterns, human patterns, and natural patterns, and larger energetic patterns, like the shift. I track patterns, and um, and I really try to kind of chart um, some ways that we might grow ourselves to attend to the changes. But I tracking, I do a lot of tracking, I think, mm -hmm. um, working with people. And, and I teach. So um, I teach at different kinds of levels. I mean, I've taught at the university level, but I also, now I mainly teach energetics, really basic energetics for all faiths. I'm really interested in us having common spiritual protocols from different faith bases in order to be able to practice together to grow our consciousness. How wonderful. I think that that's a really important piece. And, um, and I do that now at a place called Shelburne Farms in Vermont. Um, the uh, four retreats a year that are um, really trying to track the, the Earth's turning as well as your own practice in relationship to that turning, what happens differently for you with the same practices in different seasons. So on the four cross quarter days, we meet for four days. And um, at next year, it'll be five days. Um, we meet and practice together. And people come from all different faith traditions and religions and spiritual um, practices. So, um, yeah. When, when you talk about you do energy work, what can you tell us a little bit more about what that actually means? Mm. Is it healing energy? Is it uh, perceptive energy? Is it communication energy? It's, are, are all of the above? I would say that I'm really uh, helping people develop practices um, that help them be more aware and awake to whatever their, the path is that's chosen them. So if it's a nature path that's mm -hmm. chosen you, mm -hmm. then what are the practices you need to be awake to that, to work with plant spirit energy, to work with devas, you know, to, under, to, really, to really be in reciprocal communication with nature. Mm -hmm. If it's um, mystic energy, if it's about really your primary connection being with the mystery, you know, kind of in the mystic tradition, then it's what are the what are the practices and protocols that you need in order to grow that, and to help people get ready to let the path that's chosen them claim them. <laughs> if it's healing, then that. If it's if it's magic, so I'd say that there are three kind of paths. There are three main paths, 
and, and I want to be really clear when I talk about magic, what I mean about magic. And, and I mean that it's understanding the formulas and protocols that can help us shift reality and being able to use them in a way that remains conscious and without harm. That's what I mean by magic. So magic, medicine, nature path, mystical path, any of those paths can claim you. And then you need to be able to respond. <laughs> and what do you need to respond? And so um, I feel that having tracked a lot of patterns in my life and having worked with a lot of elders in, a, in multiple traditions, that um, there are some things I can do to help as a guide. So that's, does, is that clear? Does that help? Yes, it does help. Okay, good. Um, Sometimes you talk about your own work so much that you develop a language, and sometimes it's a language that, you know, you hope that other people can understand. <laughs> well, you've studied a lot with, uh, with elders in each of those traditions, mm -hmm. and that's what's been able to, to, to form the work that you do right. in teaching others the right. things that really work. And, it, and also, what, what, when I talked about crossroads, I worked with elders in traditions where the expectation was that you would follow the tradition. So the fact that I've chosen to stay at the crossroads, to train with those elders and not follow that lineage, it had, was actually quite challenging. I'm sure. And so um, getting the, those elders to be counsel for me, to help me shape my own work was really important to me because they're the foundation I stand on. Exactly. So, um, yeah. yeah. Can I name those people? Please. Well, of course. Because it's really important, I think. Um, be, um, I want to name Grandfather uh, Wallace Black Elk. I want to name uh, Inez Catalon from uh, Cajun Country. I want to name Del Wehongi from the Maori. I want to name Tepeti Curtis from the Maori. I want to name um, Tata Bunseki Fukiao, who's from Congo. Um, all of, and I want to name Denise Cooney from the European Mystery Traditions. All of those people really are part of my foundation. Every time you said another name, I just had this <laughs> wave of appreciation. Mm -hmm. They have been, they've been solid, <laughs> mm -hmm. really solid. Wow. <laughs> I'm just sitting here going. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go a little bit deeper. Where are you from? Which where are you from, are you asking me? <laughs> I, I, I have a sense that you are a spirit that is from someplace else other than Earth, and I, I'd like for you to talk about that a little bit. Well, I, I, um, I always think about people as um, the up and out people and the down and through people. And uh, so, so the up and out people for me are the ones who, who kind of were forged out of the Earth and and are really connected to the earth in deep ways and they come out of the ground. And you've, I'm sure you've known people like that. You can just feel it. You know, the earth energy is just so strong in them. Mm -hmm. And then the other people are the people who fell from the sky, who are, you know, um, inner, trapped light. I mean, they, they live in their bodies as if they're in their trapped light. And um, I'm one of those folks, I, you know, fell from the sky. But I also have been here a really, really long time. Mm -hmm. So um, up is still home, and uh, down is what I know a lot about. Mm -hmm. um, kind of looking at it upside down probably a little bit sometimes. As above, so below. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I have an experience that I'd like to share with you, and you could shed some light on it. But I had a chance to photograph John Denver mm. in New York. 
and it was in a special situation on a, in a home, but it was, he came into a, a large entryway. And when he walked through the door, the light level in the room shot up about 20%. Mm -hmm. I'd never seen that. Wow. But you, just saying that you, people that are, people that are light, that are trapped in a body, I, I instantly went to that experience and said, that, that's what I saw. I think it very well could be. And, and I, you know, things pop out of your mouth and so you just say them and, and I say trapped light. Um, it's a beautiful image. It is, I, I, but trapped, I don't want to mean trapped in terms of imprisoned or anything, but I definitely feel myself bigger mm. and more expansive than this body. And the body definitely feels like, you know, as an artist, I think about it as a design limitation. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you're always working with this. And, um, and when I was little, I, I, the games that, that I played and the games that were played with me were all about exceeding the body. They were all about going and looking and staying right here. Let the body stay right here. Go find something. Oh, isn't that interesting? Go develop your clairsentience. Develop your clairaudience. Develop your clairvoyance. Develop those things. I mean, nobody used those words, but but the environment I was in as a child really, um, in early, the early, early part, was really around so, that happening. Um, you're talking about these various abilities, skills, talents, clairaudience, clairvoyance. Clairsentience. Clairsentience. Yeah. Um, I happen to have married a woman who has all of that <laughs> in, in a lot of... Uh, She's a lot of it. Talk to her. <laughs> I have been talking to her. <laughs> no, but let's talk about this. Let's talk about these, these, these incredible skills that you have, the two of you have, that not everybody has even ever heard of. But that everybody has. Everybody has. Everybody has. All we have to do is ask and receive it. Yes. Different people have it to different levels. Just like, you know, people have a sense of color more or less than someone else, but everybody has it. What we live in a particular culture where the construct of the culture doesn't nurture it too much mm -hmm. and doesn't talk about it, um, you know, in the same way it doesn't talk about magic. But don't you think that as the consciousness of the planet is increasing, which I believe it is doing, that more and more people are becoming aware of the gifts that they have, that they're able to all of a sudden sense things in a different way, see things in a different way. Maybe it's only the people we're around. <laughs> well, I think that there are huge cultures. There are lots of cultures in the world where it's a given. Mm -hmm. I think in India, yes. for instance, you know, majority of the culture know what this stuff is. And, uh -huh. You know, they get it. I think that there are, you know, in indigenous cultures, I think there are a lot of places where it's been around all along and it's, it's, um, it's still around. I think um, there are places that I go in Europe where it's been around the whole time and it's still around. I think that the industrial mind mm -hmm. is starting to wake up a little bit to it. Yeah, I do. And, and I think that it's one of the reasons that I feel really strongly about my work, which is teaching protocols and teaching energetic practices to people, is that I think they're waking up and they don't have instruction and they don't know what to do with it. Exactly. And so um, they feel it. They feel these things and they don't know what to do. And they don't know how to make it reciprocal. So I think that there, there is, in the industrial world, I think there is more. And I think that there's a return in some of the, um, the cultures that have had it all along, who for a while got seduced by modernism, and, and thinking that modernism meant leaving that behind. And so now they're reconceiving of modernism to include all of that. 
I was very blessed. I had a teacher who was at the t at the event when I really had my awakening, mm -hmm. and uh, and her name was Grace Godwin, and she's still on the planet, mm -hmm. and she is uh, called Amazing Grace, and she is an amazing Secret. person. So she taught me mm -hmm. so that I would have a, a, the wisdom to use what was coming to me, and I think it's such a wonderful gift when you can do that. So yeah. what I'd like for you to share with our audience is how do they get in touch with you if yeah. they would like to take part in such training? Um, there are two, there are different entry points. Mm -hmm. So I think the most important thing is if people would check in with my web website and can contact me through the website and then we can start a conversation about what's the best entry point because there are the cross quarter day retreats at Shelburne Farms every year there's a new set of retreats that we're going to be doing there for people who work with other people who want to learn and enhance these skills to work with others um, and so it's really good to to check with me and then we can decide on the best entry point and usually the way that I start with anyone is that I do a divination first so that we kind of get focused on the right questions to ask mm -hmm. and how to how to what's the framework we're talking about here because moving from a physical framework to a spiritual framework is a shift mm -hmm. and so we do the divination first and then we have a conversation, then do a divination, and then we can decide together, collaborate on what the best entry point into the work is. So please tell us what your website is. It's www.k, the letter K, two trees spelled out, dot com. Wonderful. We'll also put that on the Great. page so people can locate you. Easily. Fantastic. Mm. <clears throat> You get, you're ready to say something, I can tell. Well, I, I, I'm fascinated. My experience with you in 1994 in a sweat lodge was a, a, a turning point for me, and it opened up things that had never even, I never even imagined. And uh, I saw your connection with nature that was so strong that you showed me things that I've only heard about it literally in the Bible, like the parting of the Red Sea. <laughs> but but, but you, I saw things in nature through you that I had only heard stories about, and I saw them right there up front. And it, it, it continues to make an amazing difference to me. And I, I think what I'm trying to get at is what holds us back from experiencing this all the time? Oh. We have preconceived notions mm -hmm. about how it's supposed to work. Because really, for me, nature is the mystery made manifest. Mm -hmm. And so to be in direct connection with nature and to, to really communicate with nature is to communicate with the mystery, with the womb from which everything comes, from which all things are born. The beginning, you're, you're at the point of creation all the time when you're, when you're doing that. And I think when you think about, I mean, when you think about that story about our, our meeting, you had an idea about what was supposed to happen when the rain came. Yeah. It was supposed to do X. Yeah, and so the only, thing, <laughs> the only thing in your way is that belief that this is what happens when that happens. Yeah. Instead of really going and talking to the rain. Yeah, and the, the, the viewer might want to know that, that, that we were building a sweat lodge and this incredible storm came within 30 feet of us and I figured it was time to leave immediately and I told you and you said, no, well, I've already talked to the thunder gods and the rain gods and, and they're just coming to watch you all put this together. And the rain just stood there and watched us for 30 minutes. It was one of the most amazing experiences I ever had. And yet, it showed me this incredible connection that you have with nature. That on the one hand seemed incredible, but on the other hand, we all ought to be able to do that. Well, you know, it's like having friends, though. If you want to have a really deep relationship with somebody, <laughs> you have to work at it. 
right. and you have to do relationship maintenance. And so if we want to have that kind of relationship with nature, then we need to work at it. And we need to be open beyond our preconceived ideas. And it can't be literal. It can't be around, you know, it's one of the things that, that we really work on in the retreats is, I have a lot of people who are born naturalists, and so they know everything, they know the name of the plant, the name of the bird, the name of everything, you know. And it never occurs that, to them to introduce themselves to the spirit of the bird and then let the bird answer back. We, <laughs> we had an experience this afternoon <laughs> driving here from Albuquerque. We hit the road after Española, which is, I guess, 68 or 64, and it winds wonderfully mm -hmm. through that little valley part. Along the Rio Grande. Yeah, along the Rio Grande. And as we're entering this part of the road, Karen says, oh, my God, tell her what you said. I don't remember. <laughs> <laughs> I remember. She said, this is such beautiful stuff. She said, let's ask the mountains to teach us oh. what they want us to know about this. Mm -hmm. And I'm not sure I could tell you what we learned, but it was a different drive up that road mm -hmm. than I'd ever had before. And the Sangres are great teachers. I mean, the Sangre de Cristo Mountains are great teachers. And, you know, every place has a teaching. Every place has a story. Every place has guardian spirits. Spirits of the place, of the plants, of the... And we, um, we can be in relationship with that. And it takes relationship maintenance. But we can just start the relationship by asking, what, what, do, what do you want to, what, would, what can Introduction, we Introduction, introducing ourselves. Uh -huh. Asking permission. Offering, offering something so that it's reciprocal. What am I giving? And then waiting. But introducing and asking permission, really, first important things. You know, introduce yourself and ask permission to, for the, to begin a relationship, to, to hear, to feel, to sense. And then offer some, you know, offer something from yourself. Mm -hmm. It's why you know, people give tobacco. It's why people, you know, give offerings. It's why, it's why people give offerings. So you, you introduce yourself, you ask permission, and you give something. And then there's a... It's like when you, you know, you go to somebody's house and you bring flowers. Or, so you're, you're, you're really showing the intention to build a relationship, not to take. And that, you know... and. You know, be aware of how many relationships you think you can maintain. Well, and that's a wonderful example, the story that you tell about when you moved here mm -hmm. and when you came into this place. Tell the story because it's a very important story. It built the relationship between you and your mm -hmm. landlord. Yeah, I, uh, I had found this place on the Internet, and um, as soon as we got on the phone, the it was clear that we stayed on, we talked for like an hour and a half, the mm -hmm. first conversation, and I knew that I was moving here when in fact I thought I was moving to Vermont. <laughs> and, uh, and so I moved very shortly thereafter, and I walked into a house that was, to this house, and it was not only immaculately clean, but there were fresh flowers on the counter and a welcome note. <laughs> And, um, and we had talked, too, about how the house had been cleaned, both energetically and physically. And um, so I knew that I was coming to a place that, where the people were awake. And you and, can certainly feel it when you come into this home. Yeah. And it's, and it's in the ground here. I mean, I never expected to be able to easily grow food in the desert and... You know, I am in my little garden out here. So 
it's it there's there's a lot of life in this place and it's been brought by th that the people here have honored the nature here and in that honoring the place is awake just as the people are away. I mean, it's, you can feel it, that it's both ways, that there's lots of conversation going both ways. Wow. So, I'm very happy here, I have to say. We can tell. Well, that's, yeah. Very <laughs> happy here. Very. Yes. Yeah, and it feels happy. It yeah. feels productive and happy and peaceful. Well, and you live, I live underneath Taos Mountain. I mean, it can't get better than that. <laughs> so... That's beautiful. Yeah. Do you um, do you still do sweat lodges with people? No, I don't. Or I haven't. I haven't in quite some time. Um, and uh, yeah, I because in the beginning um, I was doing a lot of teaching lodges, and I was really um, so for probably maybe shortly after your lodge, I started only doing lodges with family. It's only family, only people who'd been doing lodges for a long time. And who, um, yeah, and since then, I have been uh, really trying to work on this idea of crossroads practice so that we're really creating ceremony on standing on what we know, what I know from the NEP, and creating ceremony together that serves us all. So um, in, the last, in the last year I've been thinking about the idea, you know, we talk about the village a lot. Mm -hmm. there, there's, a, there's a, you know, we have a village model. And in the village model, people do the same thing, you know, to keep the village whole and healthy. And that's a really good model. And I come out of that, so I know that really well, and I know how well that works. Mm -hmm. And I, I w I'm really envisioning an oasis model. Uh, that, it, that there's a crossroads place that, that has the elements that has a balance of earth, air, fire, and water. And we all come there and practice together there in a different way than we do in our village. Yeah. So I don't know what that will become, how that will manifest, but I feel that we have, we are really part of this crest and this quickening and this, this disruption and all of that is the push towards be, becoming we. Mm -hmm. And we, it's, it's clear on the planet that we're not so adept at it, becoming we. Mm -hmm. No, it's, it's a hard journey that we have traveled. Yeah. And being we in the place where we don't agree, where there's tension, where I don't do it like you do it. What, what, do we call, what do we fall back on then when I don't do it like you do it? And I don't believe what you believe. How do we, how do we meet there? That's, I'm really, but we all need earth, air, fire, and water. So what's the oasis we can come to that we can come to in a good way to practice together, to pray together, to create together, to vision together, to... Uh, and what, what is it we need to know? What do we need to be responsible to in ourselves, to grow in ourselves, mm -hmm. in order to be able to come to that place as a whole and healthy being? So, um, that was a long answer to do I do so no. much anymore, no, it's but... A, it's, a, it's a wonderful answer because it leads to the next, the next question. It, it feels to me like, somehow or another, it, it, at least in this country, this shift that we're going through and riding this wave across the top of it is just pulling us apart somehow or another. And the, the question that, that, that I keep asking myself is, how are we ever going to learn to even talk with each other again? 
I think the pulling apart is, uh, I mean, in every cycle, you know, there's the, everything's a cycle. And so in every cycle, there's the falling apart, the pulling apart, the disruption, whatever. And I think that the call now is to, um, I need, in Maori, there's a word, turangawaiwai, it's your place to stand. And I think a lot of people really actually don't. Their place to stand is built on fear. And if they can't find the grounding through that fear to courage, and I mean courage in terms of the heart, mm -hmm. and have a place to stand that's truly grounded, then we can't come together. So I think the job, the work now, is for us each individually to know what we stand on and to be able to truly stand in that and still be able to reach across. Oh. I think we don't have enough of that. <laughs> yes, but, but I, that explains something that I've been feeling. That I've been feeling for the last six months or a year is that I'm standing in a different place, but I'm standing in the right place. Mm. This is really me doing what I'm supposed to be doing. And I never had that feeling quite like that. But I, I don't know, I don't know how the, the reaching of cross part is hard for me. Well, when I, when I, in, in my work, what, what the reaching across looks like to me is that I'm standing so rooted to my ground and overflowing with the with earth energy and cosmic energy no. that the overflow of that energy is reaching out that's the reaching out i don't have to do anything it's just I, I don't want i mean that's that's the optimum that you overflow with grace how can that not be reaching out so just being and receiving and, and letting it go through you just being and receiving and let yourself overflow with it cuz i mean we're designed to give and receive grace. Our breath is the giving and receiving of grace. And our bodies automatically do it. So when we actually purpose and intention our breath to be ground and open to the mystery, we can overflow with grace. I like this prompts talk. You know, one of the interesting things about being married to Chuck is that he doesn't realize how he does that every moment of the day. And that people mm -hmm. gravitate to hearing his wisdom mm -hmm. because he lives it. So every once in a while he has to be reminded. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Uh, I, I just, I have this feeling that this is truly an incredible moment for me and, and for maybe all three of us. Mm. And I hope for our viewer, because something profound has happened here this, today. And we've heard things that we haven't heard anyplace else, that, that the wisdom, the, the, the comprehension, the awareness that you have that is you. I mean, you're, you're doing exactly what you say you do. Well, and, and it's obvious. I mean, our, our viewer will get that. But the, the, the power of it is awesome. I, and I, can I respond to that just for a minute? Because I think it's really, really important to say also that I fall down and I get up. <laughs> you know, I, I practice and I fall down uh -huh. and I get up and I fall down and I get up. And I think that, um, you know, sometimes when you've been doing something for a really long time, it starts to look seamless mm -hmm. to other people. And so there's this kind of, I don't know, there's this projection that you're just this wonderful thing. But, but I fall down and I get up. And I think that the falling down and getting up is actually what makes you stronger. It's how the muscles 
those muscles grow and 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 I think the fact that you need to be reminded that you overflow with grace is a good thing <laughs> because it, that you know there's there's something that happens when we make a mistake that is really an important part of the experience of being in these meat suits <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. Meat suits, that's wonderful. <laughs> but that's what makes you the best teacher. The kind of teacher you are is the one who knows that you fall down and you, you get up. back up again. You know, the, the, the ones who are, who are out trying to project that they're always, they're always up and never have any of those moments, that's, that's not the kind of teacher I want. I want the mm -hmm. one who recognizes that 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 who they are is an expression of who we all are which is we go up mm -hmm. and we come down mm -hmm. and it's a wave that we're on yeah so yeah we're we're really grateful to be here in your presence today yeah, thank you so much for coming this is you're out here in the middle of nowhere it's lovely <laughs> no it's lovely for us it's, it's wonderful <laughs> but this has been this I didn't. I try not to have expectations, but I certainly expected it would be fun to see you again after mm. uh, uh, seventeen years. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, I didn't have any expectation, and I'm I'm clearly overwhelmed by this. But there's a question we like to ask people that we interview that I'd like your answer to. Our viewers are accustomed to hearing this, and the question is this. For the person listening to this tape right now, what would you tell them would be the best way that they could start or accelerate their spiritual growth? Be grateful. <laughs> Why do we even ask? <laughs> That's what all of the wonderful teachers tell us. <laughs> exactly. 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 The, the, the great teachers that we have met that's the answer. And that the say it one more time. Be grateful. <laughs> now say it one more time. Be grateful. <laughs> Gratitude's the best practice. Yes. And the more you're grateful for, the more you're given to be grateful for. Yeah. It, the 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 thing about gratitude for me is not even that I get more to be grateful for, but it's that I experience everything differently mm. when I'm grateful for wow. it. Yeah, that's lovely. So I experience challenges differently because I'm grateful. And I experience wonderful things, awesome things differently because I'm grateful. So both changes, changes the nature of everything. Just to be grateful. Wow. Well, we're grateful for you. And we're so grateful that you took time out of your busy schedule to share your love and your wisdom with our listeners. We are truly grateful. Thank you. And thank, thank you. you for traipsing all the way up here. Oh, this is wonderful. Just <laughs> our pleasure. And a reunion after 17 years. It's great. <laughs> this has been just a wonderful afternoon. Thank you very much. Thank Bless you. you. And we're grateful for you. Thank you. So thanks for viewing. We had a good time talking to Two Trees. And if you'd like to take a look at her book, it's called Somebody Always Singing You. And it's available at Amazon. And you can get there directly by checking the right-hand column of this page and clicking on the cover of her book and it takes you right to where it is on Amazon and you can order it easily and simply. And Karen, tell us what else we need to know. We're glad you joined us today. <laughs> it's been a wonderful time for us. We, we really enjoyed our time with Kaylin and we are very grateful for her time. Thank you for being with us. Thanks folks. <laughs>